Does your financial advisor take the time to really listen to you? Is your financial strategy personalized to you and your family? Will your financial advisor be there as your life and financial situation change? Hi, I'm Jerry Mangona, your Edward Jones financial advisor. I live here in Corktown, just a few blocks from the Daily Detroit studios. And when we work together, we'll focus on what's important to you. We'll use an established process to create a personalized financial strategy backed by the advice, tools, and resources to help you reach your goals. And we'll partner together to help your strategy stay on track. Contact me toll-free today at 866-975-8655. Again, that's 866-975-8655. Edward Jones, member SIPC. Hello, friends, and welcome to a special edition of Your Daily Detroit for Wednesday, February 22nd, 2023. I am Jer Stays, and across the table from me, we have caught a... Uh, what what day is it? Uh, it's Devin O'Reilly, but... Uh, it is not Friday! But did you say it was Wednesday? Uh, dude, dude, are you lost? <laughs> like, where's your car? I- I've wandered into the studio on a Wednesday, but I mean, we're here, so we might as well talk, right? We should, because there is news to get into, breaking news, as we are recording this, that there are new plans for a development at Cadillac Square, right around that Monroe Blocks area. We're going to dive into into it in a minute, but first of all, Devin O'Reilly, where have you been? Well, we got to start there, I think. Um, so I've got a little bit of little bit of old, little bit of new. I uh, this past weekend I went to Oak and Real, which if you haven't been, fantastic. My wife and I walked out of there thinking, or kind of determining, it has now risen to number two in the O'Reilly rankings, so to speak, in terms of best restaurants in Detroit. Seafood forward. We got the halibut, we got the ragu, which was like a seafood ragu, got a little bit of the pasta, oysters, just fantastic. Could not say enough great things about about Oak and Real. The wrinkle is they now have the upright, which is the speakeasy in the basement. Ooh. Very nice, very bad luck barish, very sugar housey, but very small. Probably no bigger than maybe the studio, really. It's very small. Uh, Only seats about 20 people, perhaps. But hot, really high end cocktails, really really heavy on kind of the artisanal aspect. So you're gonna you're gonna spend twenty five bucks on a cocktail. But for instance, I got a Sazerac, a favorite of mine, New Orleans influenced. You've got your absinthe, your bourbon. But this actually came with a death in the afternoon sidecar. Oh my gosh. So two drinks. Just even one. Be- because listeners will remember our talk about death in the afternoon. Exactly the Hemingway cocktail. Two drinks for one. So I got you got your Sazerac. Then I got an extra little drink, which is champagne and absinthe. I actually introduced my family to the death in the afternoon. I have a I have a relative cousin by marriage who is obsessed with Hemingway. Had never had death in the afternoon. Has all the books. I go down into his office in the basement, and it is ten feet of Hemingway books and old copies and whatever. Never had death in the afternoon. And let me tell you, it was a revolutionary experience. But I bet he's read death in the afternoon. He has. He has. He was so excited. He just didn't know there was a cocktail. Wow. So I had a fantastic experience. He fell asleep after death in the <laughs> afternoon, too. Well, in our purposes, death pretty ju- pretty much just means falling asleep. But okay, uh, that's, that, that's what you do. This is not a, not a drink where you're like, let's go. It's like, I'm going to go to sleep now. Exactly. Which is a good one for us. Yeah, yeah. This was a Saturday night, but I digress. Great experience at Oak and Real. So, you know, can't say enough uh, good things about that experience. Older crowd. I was surprised. A little bit of an older crowd. Okay. Um, again, relative to me being in my mid-30s even. It was probably 50s, 60s. Um, and then, and yeah, and the upright pro tip, if you go to Oak and Real, the upright does not take reservations. So what you can do is talk to your waiter or waitress, let them know you'd like to go downstairs, and they will arrange uh, a couple seats to be saved for you in the basement at the upright. So that's a, a nice tip. So you have a good good shot of getting into the upright if you're dining at Oak and Real. You know, I am so glad to see kind of like that speakeasy thing spread out to more places where it's, you know, a, a really special and kind of like a uh, a treat experience, if you will. It is. It's a great, again, you could go there on your own, but I do feel it's really cool of an experience to, to go 
have dinner at Oak and Real, and then you can kind of just pop downstairs because it really is a speakeasy. I mean, people throw that term around a lot now. I feel like everyone wants to call it a speakeasy. My thing is, if you can access it from street level or if there's a sign for it, it's not a speakeasy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it has to be hard to find or kind of hidden. And this this fits that bill. You have to go downstairs, past the, past the bathrooms. You got to find the door and it's not really marked well. Like that's a real speakeasy. Well, and there's so many great options around there now. Uh, just right around the corner, you've got some great options, both alcoholic and non-alcoholic, at the excellent Dragonfly. Yes, Jerry, I have not been you a Dragonfly. You have Dragon not been a Dragonfly? I have not been there yet. right there. It's... Uh, you hey, find the hidden bar, but you don't find the one with the run in front of you. Come on, Devin. Jerry. You know what? You know, now I'm a father now. I've got, you know, I've got, uh, I got the baby at home. We could only get away for so long, and this allowed us to have dinner at Oak and Reel and have a drink at the Upright. In my younger years, I could have also had a nightcap at Dragonfly, but I could not do it uh, this time. Fair, fair. But uh, I think you should check it out because you know these places are really starting to get a lot more uh, notoriety lately. Oh yeah, I mean it's. It, it was a thing where the, it, every every new opening was a big thing, but now, you know, they get picked up and then y you kind of forget about them in, in a sense because there's always something new coming on. But I, I, I agree. You got to you got to stay up on things because it just doesn't stop here. We're back now to the point where openings, new restaurants, new bars, new cafes are happening all the time now. And so even more reason to listen to Daily Detroit because we stay up on all that. Well, you need to know where to go. That's like half the thing, right? What to know and where to go. We got that where to go covered. Always. We do. We if do. I'm here, we got the where to go covered. And I have something what to know. Let's let's circle back to our big news of the day because I don't think we can let it sit for too long. Uh, 1.5 million square feet of development has been announced by Bedrock. This is literally, we are recording the show. The email has been in my inbox for 34 minutes. So this is pretty much the freshest kind of podcast that you're going to get. Basically, the idea of this is that this is going to I guess, replace the old plans for Monroe Blocks, which were very ambitious. Do you remember all those plans? Yeah, I think it's important for the listeners. Let's step back a minute because when Bedrock has talked about all of their developments, and again, I'm putting multiple hats on here. We had Kofi Bonner at the Detroit Policy Conference, and he kind of laid out what the priorities were. And the priorities were finish the Hudson site in, 20, you know, in, in 2023 or 2024 early, finish the book tower. And then they were kind of turning an eye to the Monroe Blocks project, which was going to be very advantageous as it is. But Monroe Blocks kind of got put on the back burner a, a little bit in, in bedrock speak. So I actually wasn't, and I don't think you were either. We weren't expecting any kind of big announcement on Monroe Blocks. So this is kind of a surprise. I, was, I, I had mentally kind of put that in the put yeah. it in the box to the left, like Beyonce would say. <laughs> exactly. Right? But this wasn't going to happen for a while. It was in the box that, to the left. That we were going to be getting like the – Monroe Midway and the whatever and for the and the drive-in theater for the foreseeable future. There are some big changes to what the Monroe Block thing. First thing I would say is the use of the National Theater. Mm -hmm. Because the National Theater was a big point of contention with the Monroe Block's plan, where originally it was going to be demoed, and then the front of it, it used to be a burlesque theater. If you're not familiar, I will put a link to historicdetroit.org in the show notes. Dan Austin, who does a great job of cataloging all these old buildings. Uh, it had life as a burlesque theater, uh, vaudeville, all that kind Beautiful of stuff. Beautiful facade. Beautiful facade, right? Uh, pretty much irreplaceable. It was going to be kind of like a an entrance archway. I wasn't necessarily against all of the plan because a lot of the inside of that theater, unfortunately, had kind of rotted away over the years. I had seen in other cities where kind of like a triumphant arch can really work and be kind of interesting. But no, this is going to be a, quote, world-class entertainment venue and anchor of the development, which is kind of huge. In fact, they're going to say 60,000 square feet dedicated to entertainment offerings, including the National Theater. So, number one, big pivot on the plan right there. It is. I mean, and it, I think it had to change. If I recall the original Monroe Blocks plan, there was a ton of office space. Which, as we know, Jer, and we talk about all the time. And we have the unpopular opinion <laughs> that maybe they don't need as much. Right. So that was bound to get downsized. And that is getting downsized in a serious way. But you know what? Still not that much. There's going to be 400,000 square feet of office space still in the plan from the original 857,000. So we're going less than half. But, I mean, 400,000 is – that's a lot of office space still. They're also going to be doing between 250 and 280 
new residential units across 230,000 square feet, 90,000 square feet for a market hall, a grocer, restaurants, and other retail. I can't tell you how many people, how many times people say grocery store, grocery store, grocery store. Now, I will shout out that some listeners have highlighted City Market in downtown Detroit as an option right there, but I've also had a number of listeners who literally moved out of downtown in the the last three years and wrote uh, long emails about why they left Detroit and moved to places like Bloomfield Hills, Royal Oak, et cetera, because they felt like they were not close enough. The premium they were paying didn't line up with being close enough to the amenities they need. And if this comes through, like a real grocer like that, you know, because Plum Market's like a grab-and-go place. Like, it's not really a grocery store, the downtown iteration. I think this helps solve some of that issue for that perception issue. I think it does. And I think that, again, I love City Market. I used to shop there a lot when I lived downtown. But it's a little bit of a niche market. It's very not claustrophobic. I don't want to use that word, but I it's mean, small. it's very small, very compact. You're kind of on top of each other. So what, what what you do have an advantage here when you're building out such a large development is this market, I'm projecting and assuming, you're going to have some space. It's going to be more of a traditional grocer, wider aisles. You couldn't take a shopping cart through City Market. It was too small. The, the turns were too too narrow. So I love City Market, but it it can't serve the entire downtown. We need more. Well, you can't charge the premium that downtown Detroit is charging without all of the required amenities. And I feel like whatever they're going, like long term. Right. And I feel like Bedrock knows this. And I think that's why they're starting to program some of these things, you know? I, I, and I think it makes sense. Having a movie theater now, adding that c- component, I think, again, I just, again, putting my projection hat on here, but, you know, the Monroe blocks or, you know, the Midway, as they were calling it, and to be clear, this is between Monroe and Randolph Streets, right near Campus Martius, prime location. Exactly. And they had the movie They had the movie theater there, the drive-in, essentially, that they popped up. I'm sure they saw that that theater uh, was very popular. And there was tons of cars, especially in the summer. So they, adding a actual movie theater, a year-round movie theater that's indoors, I think makes a ton of sense. And a huge request in our inbox. Huge request. It's one of those things. People, you know, it, look... I could never get enough bars and restaurants in downtown Detroit, but I totally get that people were like, where's the diversity? We want more things. We want different things. How about a movie theater? So here you go. More and more people are actually asking, like, where are the places to go that you can bring kids? Yeah. Right? Because that's part of, like, the whole cycle of life. If you only build for, you know, 20-year-olds, not not discriminating here, but just, like, we all went through that phase of life. You're you're not going to be able to retain that value because – you're not going to be able to build that kind of value, you know? They're saying between 1,500 and 1,800 square feet. I'll say here, everything seems to be in ranges because I think some things are still coming together with this. Let's talk about the rendering. And of course, we'll have a link in the show notes. The cover art for this episode will be the rendering. What do we think of this rendering, which I feel like to me gives me very modern vibes, very uh, uh, New York-y vibes, I was going to say the Met. Um, there's a tower here that we see, a lot of glass. I can't see how tall the tower goes, Jer, so I can't say. I hope it goes as tall as possible because, God, you I love, love tall, tall buildings. Love tall buildings. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's what we're seeing here. A lot of glass, a lot of incorporation, kind of modern, but also touching the the facade of the, the old theater. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's not yeah, – it, it'll fit. It'll fit right in, I think. It'll be great. Um a lot of open space for people to walk around and not to be, uh, you know, understated uh, about, it says again, chair, everything's very um, estimate, but about 1800 parking spaces, which, hey, I mean, we need more downtown parking. So if they can add parking, great. I mean, I would like to see a revolution in downtown parking instead of paying $20 or $30 a shot, but that will be a whole nother podcast episode, I'm sure. Uh, let's get into the timeline. They say they will be happening in three phases, and I apologize, I am reading here. The development will progress in three phases to ensure the plans are tailored to suit market demand. So that tells me they're hedging their bets a little bit. Phase one is expected to begin September 1st, 2024, following the draft. Phase two will begin in October of 2026. And phase three, January 1st, 2028. Well, like I mentioned at the beginning, I think at the end of the day, as much as we're excited about this and the announcement, Bedrock smartly is uh, is trying to be prudent about the timeline here. They've got to finish the Hudson site, which is a massive project. They got to finish Hudson's. They got to finish Book Tower, 
and then they can focus on this. So this is really kind of the third in line in terms of what they're going to focus on. So it, it makes a lot of sense that it's not going to be until 2028. This does cover the two blocks that go from Campus Martius, that, that kind of like empty block that's a giant like parking lot right now of Cadillac Square, and then the block next to it that goes kind of almost a Butts Creek town. So it really fills in that density hole there. Uh, I I like this a little bit better. I don't think we can say what it'll be. We don't really even have a price tag on it yet, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, this was something where when it was kind of first announced in 2018, they were talking about a little over $2 billion in construction. So we don't have a price tag yet, but this was going to be a bigger price tag at the time than the Hudson site. So I, I don't, I feel like looking at the renderings, this is, I hesitate to use the word scaled down. I almost want to say scaled right. That's, you know what, Jared, that's a really good way to put it. I don't want to scaled be a show right. for them on this, but like, I feel like this feels a little bit like it's actually more like it's going to happen in a more like a, a reasonable timeline. Totally. Because again, th we're thinking about this as the current demand where the Hudson site is going to take care of some residential demand, some commercial office demand. So that'll take some of that off the thing. So you don't need this much for the Monroe blocks. So I think it's right sizing in a sense. I'm still skeptical in office space. So 400,000 square feet. I was about that because I'm, I am too. Like as much as we've talked about like the push to return back to work, I just don't, I was, I was listening to a couple of shows on different topics and it seems to be the universal agreement that the world is not going back to what it was, no matter how much anybody wants to believe. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I, th I still think 400,000 is uh, uh, more space than they'll need for office. But again, 2028, hey, look, man, we go year by year here. I I don't know what 2028 is going to hold. You know, that's like looking at, what, what six, uh, five years ahead? That's like sitting in 2018 predicting what's going to happen Your in Your kid's going to be in elementary school. I'll have to start looking for office space for her and maybe an apartment. So... <laughs> This will be just in time. Feels like it'll be tomorrow. <laughs> Any criticisms of it? No, I think the criticisms will come. <laughs> I think like, the, it's too Jared, early for the Jared, criticisms will I, come. Can, yeah. can I do a nice bridge for you? I think the criticisms will come when we get to the tax abatements, the incentives, that portion. Um, I, I predict that people will not be happy with the money that's going to uh, to get uh, to get given to <laughs> the Gilberts and Bedrock because – Look, I know how this goes. A lot of people aren't happy when that happens. Um, so I think that'll be the biggest criticism once we start getting some numbers and once we start understanding how much Bedrock wants the the DDA, the tax capture, uh, to pick up the bill. I think I think you're right. I think if this was a situation where it was just, hey, they're going to build it, whatever. No, no, no downside. It's a parking lot right now. It's literally a parking lot right now. Although I do remember, I do remember when there was a parking garage. <laughs> right. Do you remember back in the day there I, was that? Remember that club that was in there mm -hmm. in the bottom of the garage? And then there were a couple of ice cream shops and then the shoe store, which moved across the street. Yes. But that garage was falling apart. So suffice to say, if it wasn't going to be this, there ain't a developer, business owner, individual in living in Michigan who could make a project of this size happen other than a Dan Gilbert, other than a Bedrock. So you know what? I'll go back to what I always say. If you, you know, if it was going to be anything, it's going to be this or else it's a parking lot forever. Well, of course, always welcome with your thoughts. DailyDetroit at gmail.com. This wasn't the episode we think we were thinking we were going to be producing. But, no, dear. Uh, well, when I wander in on a Wednesday, I mean, we got like When you wander into Wednesday, <laughs> I start questioning myself on the camera. I hope that I hope the listeners really think that I just wandered in. It's not too far off, but <laughs> it's, it's close, though. It's very close. It's like a text and then a wander in. Yeah. I mean, you know, anyone in the Daily Detroit family is always want, welcome to wander by. What, 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 what did the kids say? You up? Is that the... <laughs> oh, jeez. Like, you up? I got a you up from Devin today. You, you up, Jer? Well, that is it for a special edition of the show. Glad I wandered in, Jer. Lots of good stuff to talk about. I know, especially because it's like freezing rain out there. Thank God I've got a place to go, Jer. You know, Dearborn is not too far from the studio, so I was glad I could uh, just wander in here on a on a cold and rainy Wednesday. Well, it was a pleasure. With that, I am Jer Stays. Thank you so much for listening to your Daily Detroit. I am Devin O'Reilly. Remember that you are somebody, and we'll see you around town. <laughs>